And I'll be particularly thinking and getting you to think about the milieu, the architectural milieu, the spatial milieu that people and actually experience as both patients, as members of staff, and as a visiting public coming to this institution. And the way that both structured sound in various ways, but also the way in which people came in with expectations about what they were going to hear, and the way in which, to some extent, therefore, sound was not just a biologically attuned thing to how the brain is receiving, but the, the conditioning of the way in which people receive sound. Many of you won't know so much about the history of Bethlehem. Some will, some won't, so apologies to those who already know all of this, but I thought I'd just give you a very brief introduction to the hospital itself. Here it is when, when first established at Bishopsgate, um, close to what are now Liverpool Street Station, of course. It's a very small, as you'll see, in institution, which originally um, in the 14th, uh, at the end of the 14th century, beginning of the 15th century, had about six patients. By the early 17th century, um, and really up until the mid 17th century, had roughly between 20 to 50 patients. So very small scale in London. Here it is at its site, where you could, um, at Liverpool Street, the modern uh, Bedlam. But here it is, which and this is the the building that I want to focus on a little bit more, which is the. 1676 building at Moorfields, um, and you can see here where it's moved across from Bishopsgate, not very far, contiguous to London Wall um, here, and you see already this long structure, and I want you to think about that architecturally, what that m might have meant as well for it as a soundscape, and that's in particular what I want, want to think about here, and also the fact that it fronted this expanse of Moorfields, which was a kind of a playground, an area where lots of activity was going on, and again had its own sound, soundscape, which had a permeability within the hospital structure. Here is a, a, another image of its front, front of speech, and many people compared it to a palace for lunatics. It was a, a lot of money had gone into it, and people were already commenting um, in anticipation, very enthusiastically in first visits, often talking about their sound base encounters. I, the main things I want to focus on, I mean, are the architectural structuring of sound, but also this cultural conditioning. And what did people hear, and what did they expect to hear? I mean, what I also want to say is that, of course, the history of Bethlehem has been considerably affected by a number of mythologies, and mythologies that, that to some extent, have affected the way historians uh, reported the fact that there was something really quite unique about this hospital, and it was uniquely exposed to a visiting, spectating public. It became a, something you would do as, as, a, as, a, as a tour. And, and this is the sort of thing that most people know, knew, know about Bedlam popularly. But this encouraged early um, representations of the whole experience of that visit with a lot of mythologizing, historical inaccuracy. These blue areas highlight the main areas of mythology and factual error within these uh, um, early historical presentations. I don't want to actually tell you why they're all mythologies yet. I mean, if you want to ask about those, we, I can talk more. But I really want to talk a little bit um, more about the, 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 the sound elements of Bedlam. So I just want you to have a look at some of these blue highlights that I've highlighted you, to, to give you a sense about how his, historians talked about Bedlam as an environment here. Um, uniquely, to some extent, but not totally uniquely, open to a touristic visiting public. Um, okay, much of this mythology, I want to move on from here, was, has been challenged by revisionist histories, which have actually um, tended to emphasize a, a number of things, including that the hospital was open to visitors, partly because this reflected its charitable identity, its kind of emphasis on needing to actually generate income, but also to show the insane as an exhortatory model, uh, as a, an appeal to charity to some extent. And that visiting was not entirely, therefore, an unregulated um, activity in terms of the public. There were regulations that attempted to regulate and visiting and bring in visitors of quality and exclude the idle and dissolute, and to curtail the excesses of the public coming in. To also, you know, emphasise that the, the main function of visitors, the expected function, etc., was doing good, um, even if that actually wasn't often how visitors were, were behaving. 
And much of revisionist history has tended to emphasize that the motivations for people coming in, the impact of that visit on what they saw, what they heard, what they intent, int thought about madness were varied, in fact. And that while curiosity, entertainment was drawing people, so were other kinds of motivations. Um, recently, of course, there's been a lot of modern tra trends in academic research which has seen a significant shift to exploring not just the landscapes of these sorts of institutions, their architecture, their spatial aspects, um, but increasingly to think about how they sound, not just what was seen, what was heard at these institutions. Very much critiquing, departing from Michel Foucault's classic influence on the madhouse is creating a kind of discursive silence, um, silencing um, madness to some extent. The historians now tend to highlight and indeed pay much more attention to listening to um, the, 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 the institutions that they study um, and emphasize the sort of vividness indeed of the soundscapes of these institutions. And a range of work, for example, Dolly McKinnon's Hearing Madness, a soundscape of the, of the asylum, a work on Australian 19th century asylums, as well as some of the work that I've cited here on hearing places and, and, and some of the work that's coming from um, people who may be present, historical musicologists or musicologists, um, ethnographers, environmental historians and acoustic scholars as well as, um, have significantly influenced the way, I can think particularly recently in the past couple of decades, the way historians have thought about sound. Of course, the thinking about Bedlam conjures up a, a, a need to really explain, well, how is it then that Bedlam got this sort of association between, that we all know now almost proverbially, that it means chaos, that it means noise, effectively, it's Bedlam in here. And there are indeed countless examples of the passage of this association into modern parlance. Here's a quote from the Telegraph, um, which relates that noise to having noisy neighbours and a household, a sort of domestic um, noise. And here's one from a, an American source, a blogger in 2014, who talked about Bedlam and linked it to school cafeterias, to fr frat parties. Um, and when I think of Bedlam, I go immediately to noise. So we all, all of us are sort of aware of that association, but really we need to understand well, how and when and by what processes has that historically um, developed. Well, one of the, um, this is partly an etymological, but it's much more of a sort of, uh, in a way, an archaeology of the knowledge of sound that we could be thinking about. And, and we can relate that very much to uh, genres of literature, such as the Bedlam ballads of the uh, late many uh, Middle Ages and the Renaissance and the early uh, uh, 16th and 17th centuries, which show Tom and, uh, Tom and Bedlam's an authentic or indeed counterfeit uh, mad vagrant who's begging evoke both sympathy and persecution. Um, and these are routinely um, um, emphasized by scholars indeed. Many historians have noted a tendency for madness, more especially in its florid, more manic manifestations, to present and to be represented in many ways as a state of noisiness, of, a, of not just noise, but, almost, but also incoherent noise, of something fearful, shocking, odd, disturbing to others. A Michael McDonald's study of 17th century casebooks of the clergyman physician Richard Napier stress the frequency of, the, of those who came to him reporting um, these sorts of phenomena. And here is a quote, they noisily express weird laughter, horrible screams, continual babbling. Um, laughter being a special token of antic madness. Even when they were not laughing, they made frightening um, noises. Of course, it's long well known that the, the um, frantic moods of the, those who were contemporaneously called the mad, I'm using terms like the contemporary terms mad rather than the modern term mental illness because it's more historically accurate, so I hope that doesn't offend anyone, but it's more appropriate for the period I'm talking about. Um, of course, it's well known that for the frantic news movement, and often alternated and overlapped with other types of mood issues, sadness, moping, and that indeed the um, mentally deranged could be um, characterized less by their noise than by their taciturnity, by their silence. So clearly this is also part of what people reported on, not just the noise within Bedlam, but indeed the lack of it in some, in some patients and require. Thomas Fitzgerald, in a poem uh, that was much quoted from in 1733, though, emphasized that it, much more it was the noisiest of the maniac, the rattling chains, the wretch, all raving lies, roars and foams, earth and heaven defies. Um, but contrasted this again with the other side, the phlegm, the melancholic, 
who is lifeless and is moping, and is to some extent taciturn. This is the sort of classic, to some extent, diptych. So what about the etymology of these terms? Well, I've done a study looking at literary and uh, uh, lexicographical sources and other cultural sources to see well, when is it that this sort of um, chaos of noise and sound it begins to be associated um, with Bedlam. And we can see this in particularly in late uh, 16th, early 17th century literature, these sorts of quotes, but also continued with some of the quotes I'm putting up here from uh, from, from the 18th century, well, um, and particularly from lay literary sources, some of whom had, had actually physically visited um, Bedlam and were reporting, some of whom had vicariously or re really repeating the cultural constructions of others. They were, there was a lot of borrowing within this type of literary um, presentation of the sounds of Bedlam, but also a lot of linking of it to notions of linking insanity to the movements of planets, of the stars, astro older astrological thoughts, the dog star causing the noise, producing the noise, that the bodies of the insane are then permeable to things from the outside that are impacting on producing noise phenomenologically from them. Um, here we have another range of similar quotes, and we can see the continued heritage of this sort of sense which Bedlam is beginning to culturally mean, not just uh, but both chaos and a sort of bedlam breaking loose, but also something that is, that is in almost quintessentially noisy. That seems to be its cultural um, meaning um, carried from text to text to text. Bedlam let loose. Um, of course, um, if you look at dictionaries of the period, though, in fact, many dictionaries don't reflect um, this lexicographical um, link, many indeed just simply define bedlam as a madhouse or a type of madman. And so lexicography dictionaries aren't necessarily good indices to actually mapping when this happened. In fact, it's much more literary and literary sources that seem to be better at mapping when this uh, um, linkage is beginning to happen. Um, but madness was already a pervasive literary trope in the, as I already said, the, the, the Jacobean drama, Elizabethan drama, Tom of Bedlam type ballads. And by the early 18th century, um, works like Pope's Dunciad placed a special emphasis on the irrationality or manners that defined by its din and the meaningless nature of its din. Um, sometimes relating this to, um, again, critiques of nonconformist preaching, for example, of, of religious enthusiasm. As Edmund Curl highlighted for later Augustan readers of Pope, um, um, the goddess of God, Domnus, this was from Pope's Dunciad, among the exiles, the poet proposes chattering like a monkey, braying like an ass, cat calls, a drum for encouragement. So this is also a noise that tends to emphasize the atavistic nature, uh, the an and link noise, a particular noise of the insane, to a sort of animalistic um, identity. He quotes the Dunciad lines, Now a thousand tongues are heard in one loud din, the monkey minics rush discordant in. It was trashing, grinning, mouthing, jabbering, all a noise, etc., etc. As Kurt explained, um, indeed, um, this, this is a parody of, of Methodist preacher, preaching of people like Whitefield and Wesley, the, who had actually set up their bantering booths in Moorfields. And, and therefore, their, their method of preaching, their method of actually preaching to their flocks, was actually being related again to the sort of conversion of uh, their adherents into noisy Bedlamites. So the fittest place for Whitefield, indeed, the Methodist preacher, was where he sent many of his converts as uh, noisy adherents of Methodism to Bedlam. This is the model. Um, there was closer, close association then of the din, apparently, that people expected to hear and were strongly linking with madness, was very much linked to this, the widening of a polemical campaign against religious and political enthusiasts after the English Civil War, after the Restoration, where people often harped on the hellfire preaching of religious radicals as irrational, capricious, and productive of madness, of din, of cacophony. Um, for example, John Oldham's character in, in his 1675 work, which was a coarse satire, papist priest said, when I first came to this church, I was sudden lost all my senses in noise. He had preached half his parish deaf. His din is beyond the, this is the Ethiopians, the Kadupai of Nile, the people who made meeting him was frightened into fanaticism. Another is in, on Bedlam 
on the same occasion. So the, what I'm saying here is that the increasing association of Babylon with chaos, with pandemonium, is clearly linked discursively to position, its positioning and its spectacular exposure, particularly after its rebuilding of Moorfields, via the widening of touristic visiting and a sort of actual and also vicarious literary spectating, um, associating, increasingly associating the noise and noise with this. And so, in many ways, Bedlam served as a kind of microcosm um, for the disordered passions, the excesses of Great Britain in general, one great Bedlam within Britain, and was regularly and easily then referenced as a kind of metaphor metaphorical as well as a, a sort of appropriate resonance for those who were, t were too noisy, too loud, irrationally loud, the declaimers, the enthusiasts, uh, those driven mad by apparent f fanatical religiosity. Um, it's evident that contemporary sources in replaying and replaying these discourses are reflecting to some extent a genuine, if we could call it that, biological, symptomological aspect of mental illness, uh, 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 the noise of frenzy, um, we could say. And, but, and they also, to some extent, replicating something about Bedlam's architectural spatial soundscape. But this is also something that is quite clearly innately socially conditioned and culturally constructed um, in terms of contemporary experience, so, which tends to exaggerate, inflate, hyperbolize um, these phenomena as proverbial features of all the insane, to some extent. Um, and it's evident the reported noisiness of the mentally inflicted was therefore ex affected very intimately by expectations of the typical sick role, the typical insane role. So in a way that the experience was to some extent being structured here. Donald Lupton in his London and the Country Carbonado in 1632, for example, wrote, it seems strange anyone should recover here. The crying, screechings, roarings, brawlings, shaking of chains, sweatings, etc. So hideous, so great, they were able to drive a man out of his wits rather than, um, um, have his wits rather out of them. Um, Thomas Fitzgerald in his Bedlam poem said, forever from the echoing rooster bounds a dreadful din of heterogeneous sounds, from this, from that, from every quarter, loud shouts, sullen groans, doleful cries, heart softening plaints, etc. And uh, mingling, therefore, a sort of mixture of both shock and pity in the reportage. They're the two kind of dominant discourses that we're seeing coming out here. Well, um, of course, the impact of Bedlam's Din is something that we need to think about. Um, and it's clearly linked to uh, what, uh, a sense in which insanity in this period is seen in quite, a, quite low, degraded, atavistic terms in ontologically as in a degraded state. And this is clearly combined with both experiential elements and sensory elements as well as a prevailing attitude. Um, and it means that pity is often mingled with, uh, um, with or compromised um, significantly by elements of shock, elements of aversion in the reportage of, of the sounds that are going on. Um, liberally deploying the metaphor trope of a bedlam visit, for example, Jonathan Swift in his writings, such as the Legion Cub, famously stressed what the impact of this combined, what he called the noise, the sight, the scent, the very smell, all of these sensory affections being somehow assailed by the notion of bedlam, which spent, exhausted his spirits, forced him to retire. Okay, that seems, we could take that very literally, of course, though in fact, uh, Swift's targets for here were not the insane themselves. He was actually talking about Irish politicians and the way they behave in the Irish parliament. And it's very important to distinguish that, again, these two discourses, which can easily and too easily, and have been too easily by historians, collapse into each other and by some literary critics. Early evangelical critics of the noise of, uh, actually that occurred in, on visits to Bedlam included people like Thomas Tryon, who blamed, indeed, the noise of Bedlam more on the noise and conduct of the public than actually on the insane themselves. He criticised permitting visitors to abide for hours, making so much noise and pestering patients with these endless questions that the patient's quiet was being disturbed. Indeed, he said how typically young drunken visitors actually fired impertinent questions at patients, such as, why, why are you here? How long have you been here? Enhancing their entertainment, trying to, uh, producing their own laughter and hooting at the raving and cursing. Uh, twice more fierce and violent, indeed, making patients twice more fierce 
than they had been before. So that, again, of course, on the other side here, this is a polemical account that we need to take with a pinch of salt, aimed to critique the impact very negatively of visitors on patients in terms of, the, the, of how phenomenologically that's happening. Um, one Easter visitor reports the world in 1753 as um, similarly recounts crowds who have suffered unattending to run rioting up and down the ward, making diversion of the inhabitants, and observed that some were provoked by the insults of this mob into furies. And then the spectators uh, laughing. So this whole sense in which there's a combination here of the, the noise of patients with the noise of visitors being produced. Yet, we need to be careful about taking these accounts at face value. Um, and to s situate them again, again well, how do patients themselves give accounts of how they experience visits? We don't have many um, uh, accounts, and that's part of the problem, from patients themselves to set against this much larger, in fact, huge literature of reports by visitors. But while many did clearly experience disturbance and abuse, a few patients clearly found some degree of function, some functional benefit from their dialogue with visitors, especially those who were more articulate, more resourceful, more literary, it could be said. Like the naval clerk confined at Pe uh, uh, Samuel Pepys' incident at the end of the 17th century, first at Finsbury Madhouse and then at Bethlehem itself and who wrote poems called Lucida Intervala, or Lucid Intervals, really subverting, indeed, these visits and subverting the attempts to physic him by the physicians. The only question he records from a visitor directly is neither loud nor rude, but kindly. The Duke of Upgrafton asking considerably how he did. It's not the noise, indeed, or the noisome, as in annoying, um, conduct of the public or other patients that, in fact, Carcass complains of, but, in fact, confinement itself, being deemed to be mad. Visitors, in this respect, are actually welcome releases. They can be people who provide a prize link with the outside. They can give gifts. They can deliver things. They can, they, uh, they can give somebody an ability to negotiate, to barter. barter. Visitors, therefore, also break up monotony. They can transform, not just negatively, but positively, the moods of some um, inmates. And Carcass's poems reveal a, de a degree of rapture at the advent, particularly he's very pleased to report female visitors providing a degree of sexual frisson in a, in a segregated between sexes institution, as well as a great pride at those um, lords and ladies, the members of the aristocracy who visit him, who provide him with a degree of ecstasy. So he's writing up and bigging up himself through this the visiting opportunity he gets. So visiting ops can be visiting uh, visitors can be opportunities for cloister patients to get a welcome source of sim symbolists to provoke um, romantic sensibilities to connect with their libido for, um, and to inflect their identities a different way. And they are also, as as I've said. Um, can provide a sense of inspirational muses, ornaments to uh, the rather barrenness of confinement. Um, many of the accounts that, we're look, that I'm talking about play on the experience of visiting bedrooms like a visiting a kind of torment or noisy hell, as we can see in Carcass's own um, poems here. Um, but the the exploitative noise uh, that he—it's uh, the exploitative noise that, that, that of, of which he's complaining—is indeed um, is the physician Thomas Allen's kind of noise. The quack hugs himself with the conceit secure he should credit get by Parsons cure. To work he goes with claims of medical spreads the noise. So the noise here is actually making his case public. Um, that um, Carcass is most worried about. Now, he is also replaying here late medi medieval, renaissance, and even themes of, of, of seeing prisons or bedlams almost proverbially as types of hell, full of noisy torments, full of the screamed of the damned and the afflicted. So there's a sort of literary trope that's been played out again even in this work. So in his Jack Saw's Progress poem, um, he talks about the three keepers and the porter representing the body and the heads of a vicious Cerberus who bedlam make with chains and darkness hell, I bedlam heaven full, but find it hell, etc., etc. Um, while he recognised, indeed, that Bethlehem's chains of noise and its cold and privations um, were problematic, he also partially then sublimates 
these things. Converts the, um, the visit of a tin man's wife into a functional allegory, fancying his change, are forged by her spouse and transmuted to gold and become almost ornamental things, shaming his heart. And pro while probably only a minority of patients are able to subvert these, these sorts of experience through wit, through metaphor, and all to their experience, it's, that's worth saying. But um, and Carcass jokes regarding the, the madhouse that he's first in at Finsbury, that Dr. Allen prescribed chains of iron to take him off his metal, but brass did him in viron. My fetters were but straw. This is the physician talking to the sinews of his arms, and he bursts bars and doors. So he's constantly trying to subvert the you know, wider sense of this, the, the meaning of this confinement on, on him. These sorts of um, sources tend to lessen then Foucault's stress and confinement as silencing the discourse of the man. And revisionist historians have tended to spot that, how many patients indeed not only talk back, but to some extent play to the gallery, performing and vocalizing to leverage to certain gifts, certain privileges, certain amusement or metaphysical release here. Um, putting on a show for attention, food and material gifts being well substantiated in the sources, dancing, singing, being recurrent, also literary themes and depictions of visitors' encounters with bedlamites. Popular ballads like The Maid of Bedlam often played on the fictional morbid trope of a mournful singing um, um, of patients combined with the rattling of chains, as in this example here. One morning very early, one morning in the spring, I heard a maid in Bedlam, most wonderful, did sing. A chain she rattled on her hands, while sweetly thus she sang. I love my love because I know that he loves me. The captain, um, who patient, who was reported by the visiting um, German visit of the von Offenbachs in 1710, appeared highly delighted with a shilling or two they threw down to him. And indeed, the, the sort of performance, the, the tomfoolery, the virtuosity of these patients does suggest, suggest an expected sort of extravagant contact, extravagant noise. Um, um, that attracted visitors into these environments, but also suggests that patients were competing via their sounds, via their noise, via their performance for center stage um, here. So what about other aspects of this noise in terms, in, in particular, the fact that Bedlam is a place associated with considerable um, mechanical restraint. So how, do, how does the iron um, nature of the noise suffuse the environment of Bethlehem and actually um, uh, uh, impact on, on the visits of, uh, of the public? Um, Sensationalising Grub Street or journalistic accounts of visiting like Ned Ward's famous London Spy also played an on, an, on the common theme of Bedlam and Hell on Earth, recycling earlier discourses about Bedlamites as tortured demoniacs. But they likewise drew attention to this distinctiveness of the institutional din of clanging iron gates and chains, as well as the association of, of, association of madness with passions and uncontrolled outbursts. We were admitted, says Ward, through an iron gate. There sat a sprawny Cerberus leaning upon a money box. We are turning through another iron barren cave, where we heard a rattling of chains, such drumming of doors, ranting, etc., etc. I could think of nothing but Don Cuvallo's vision, where the dam broke loose put hell in an uproar. Early visitors also explicitly stressed their encounters with, with conspicuous mechanical strength, like John Di Evelyn in his diary. Um, this, uh, this extensive presence, then, of iron doors, of gates, grates, manacles, chains, leg locks, probably lent a specialness, to some extent, to environments like Bedlam, although not dis distinctive from certain prisons, uh, a resounding iron tone, indeed, to the acoustic spaces of the hospital. Um, there are limited available sources to actually quantify the extent of mechanical restraint, um, but some sources do give us a sense of quite significant restraint. Uh, the purchasing of, of 60 leg locks and 12 handcuffs in the 1760s suggests they were widely support, supported. And also the fact that the, the institution is run by a relative, relative skeletal staff in terms of its uh, at, at patient staff ratios. At Old Bethlehem, patients were free to walk in the galleries if they were deemed well defaced. Uh, behaved, so not all were in change, and at Moorfields, they were only locked up in their several cells, routinely at meal and bedtime. So we, that's also, it's also worth emphasizing in terms of we shouldn't overemphasize the degree of mechanical restraint. There's clearly freedoms to walk and freedoms to be out. So, but chains and iron noise seem to be relatively important in terms of the auditory experience um, of Bethlehem. 
Villager's accounts often mention chains irons, but most accepted the restraint enforcers necessary. César de Saucer, like Pierre Grossly, almost 50 years later, found a corridor cells where most patients were chained. But the evidence suggests that only a minority for prolonged periods were in chains at Bethlehem. De Saucer described these maims as dangerous, terrible to behold, um, though there were also those he referred to as inoffensive madmen who walked in the gallery. Um, fictional visits like those pictured again after Bedlam's gates to be closed officially to visitors in 1770 in The Man of Feeling by Henry Mackenzie, famous Age of Sensibility not novel, highlighted both the shocking impact of the Bedlam din, and, but also how staff sought to thrill and procure tips via tours of the most extravagant patients, as shown in this quote, which again emphasizes the clanky of change links it to the wildness of the prize of patients. Um, there is, of course, both elements of ideology as well as some degree of phenomenological reality in um, Bethlehem's noise. And we could say that um, it's, it's, we could point to the cases of noisy patients from other institutions where, for, because of their noise, were actually being transferred to Bedlam because they were too noisy for other institutions. Um, sleep, deprivation, and disturbance were, of course, being frequently recognized as chief symptoms of mental illness but are likely worsened, could likely be worsened by proximity within these types of institutions, particularly Bathroom to um, of quiet patients to noisy. The lack of discrimination, and, indeed, between the symptomological manifestations of patients. And these were things that were actually complained of by patients themselves in case books. There were some signs, indeed, in the 18th and more over the 19th century of attempts to police and quell the, these um, types of noise production. However, patient narratives, like Urban Metcalfe's 1880 narrative, written as a description of Bethlehem Hospital, um, suggest significant inequities in the way these quieting um, techniques were implemented by staff, with favoritism, corruption, and um, um, benefiting those patients, even if they were noisy, um, who were able to you know, basically um, um, bro partly bribe the staff through this, while others who were, who were less noisy were sometimes demoted to the basement, um, even though less noisy than others. Um, and here, this quote refers to that. I don't want to go into details. Um, so phenomenologically, patients may have been noisier due to a limited, um, for particular reasons that we, we need to sort of put alongside the more cultural construction of noise here. For example, the limited sedation, by contrast with the liberal chemical restraint in Victorian asylums, especially after the 1860s, needs to be thought of here. And some patients' florid delusions were clearly productive of noisy outbursts and amplifying or provoking other patients' noise reporting. Indeed, the reporting of these sorts of symptoms by contemporary observers ever, both registers, but also, I would say, exaggerates and stereotypes um, the noise of the insane. Um, the, for example, the famous the author, the anonymous author, who's probably a member of staff of the sketches in Bedlam, written in 1823, commented exploitatively, though not without affection, regarding a number of patients' noise, including the, the woman, the patient called Charlotte Harding, was known as, as the queen, or one of a number of queens, whose rivalry with two other self-proclaimed um, queens um, under one roof disturbed the tranquility of their, uh, in his view, shared realm. So for him, Bethlehem's gallery, therefore, becomes the theatre of a fierce and clamorous war of words, attitudes, and grimaces. Each claimed the exclusive right of power, disowning the others. And indeed, they all got their adherence from other patients who raised their own vigor of voice and volubility of tongue. And here, indeed, of course, patients are experiencing genuine auditory paranoid hallucinations. And it's likely that, but it's also likely that within this particular environment, there were a degree of aggravation and exaggeration in terms of this as a feature of institutional noise. How long do I have? Ten minutes. All right, I want to conclude. <coughs> okay. I've been arguing then that Bethlehem had, uh, had indeed a strong influence, not just on how post-restoration and Georgian, the Georgian public saw and thought about 
this institution, but and mad madness in general, but indeed on what they heard and, or expected or indeed imagined hearing in, in terms of their encounters here. Um, oops. Uh, so understanding the noise of Bedlam demands indeed examining the, the main cultural and metaphorical and semantic frames that actually denominated that noise, its character, and as well as its representational meaning. As well as addressing and balancing the perspectives of, of both lay and medical staff and the spectating wide and public, but also those of patients themselves. And this way, I've attempted to show you um, something about the origin functions of the linguistic and symbolic connotations of Bethlehem with, with uproar and noise, both as cultural trope, but also as phenomenological and spatial or environmental reality, if you can call it that. Um, but I've also sought to grant some degree of audibility and attention to well-documented, but often rather varied elements of the symptomological essence in, of Bethlehem's noise. And hopefully have offered some challenges to the degree of distortion, cultural construction, and hyper hyperbole in classic representations of this over, over quite a long expanse of the hospital's history. And what most, what most, most importantly is that there is much more to indeed George and Bedlam, its soundscape, the audio impressions they're experiencing, than mere cacophony and chaos. Indeed, the noise of bird songs, the noise of trees and, and coming through from Moorfields into patient cells from the outside of that building because Bedlam's um, uh, uh, windows were not glazed. Those more pleasant noises tend to be obscured by these types of, of, of cultural construction of the noise of that. Okay, thanks very much.